You've already been prime minister of this glorious nation, so what do you do for an encore? Well, that was the question faced by Joe Clark at just 39, our youngest PM ever. One who played an important role in the real life, non-fiction version of the movie Argo, AKA the Iran hostage crisis. Joe didn't last long in the job, though seven months in, his government fell on a non-confidence vote on the budget. All the opposition parties have condemned the budget as robbing the poor to pay the rich. His response? serve the country once more as foreign minister under Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, where he helped lead the way on the right side of the apartheid debate. And later, when the new Conservative Party of Canada was born, Joe refused to join. So imagine what Joe, who has a new book called How We Lead about Canada and what he believes our role on the world stage can be. Imagine what he thinks about some of the current political scandals and the big institutions like churches, business, and the banks that shape the world we're in today. Please welcome the 16th Prime Minister of Canada, the Right Honourable Joe Clark. Okay. Okay. How are you? Great, sir. How are you? Very good. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Clark, Mr. Prime Minister, you uh, when you watch the news over the last handful of months and see what's going on in this country, and I don't just mean with the Prime Minister's office in the Senate, but with Rob Ford, with the Montreal mayor, with just, I mean, what do you think? Well, it's depressing, obviously. Um, the, um, and it's important because you have to have a, a sense of respect for, for public life in the country. And uh, that's hard to maintain in these circumstances. Mm -hmm. But we've been through bad patches before. I won't speak of any of my personal experience. <laughs> but uh, we get over them, and I think we can. I, part of the reason, I don't want to get too quickly into my book ahead of you, yeah. but part of the reason I'm interested in writing this book is that I think Canadians have stopped talking to one another about uh, things that we can do together. Yeah. And uh, as you look back in the history of this country, uh, we're first of all not an easy country, we're a lucky country, but we're not easy because we can fall back into our own little silos. And when we've done great things, it's because we have talked to one another, different people, different languages, uh, different regions, about what we can do together. That's stopped. Uh, that's a different question from the sort of uh, the, the sideshows that distract us now. Uh, but it's a pretty important question, and uh, I think we need to have those conversations again. Is this a blip that we come back from, or is this just a natural extension of what we've seen in the House of Commons for the last 10 years, where the disrespect has happened, the, the concept of disagreeing without being disagreeable is gone. And is this just a natural progression of, 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 for us? To some degree it is, and it's not just us. I mean, if you take a look ar around the world, one of the things that's happened in the last several years is, is that institutions which used to command respect, and that was not always a good thing because they got away with things they shouldn't have got away with, no longer have that respect. That's the case with churches. It's the case with, uh, with political institutions. It's the case with business. It's the case with banks. Uh, and in a sense, that's a celebration of freedom. There are more views around. There are more things happening. Uh, but the factors that knit us together, the factors that build respect, that caused us, cause us to look beyond our immediate interest, those are deteriorating everywhere. So what do we do about that? I think we have to take a look at them not as old-fashioned values, but take a look at them as, as how we can adapt those durable values to modern times. Uh, and I think that's possible. We've had to do it before. Uh, the world's gone through great changes before, uh, and uh, we found ways to do it. It requires will, and again, that comes back to, to conversations and a willingness to, uh, to listen to others. There's not a lot of that uh, no. going on now. So the title being How We Lead, is it here's how we are currently leading, or is it here's how we could lead? It's how we could lead. Yeah. Uh, but I also uh, want to... There's a very interesting point about Canada. When the Fathers of Confederation built this country, nobody had foreign policy on their mind. Uh, it, was, it was a domestic country. And for a long time, that was the case. The Second World War changed that, in part because the world changed dramatically, but also because, for a variety of reasons, Canadians were ready to shape a new world when that came. But are we the country to do that now? We may be in terms of, uh, if you look at the way we've acted, if you look at our, what happened with us in the Security Council, if you talk about our, our changing role in Europe, how we used to be a country that cared about the environment, said so, 
Now, the criticism of this country is that we actually ob are the obstacle in a lot of these ways. Like, the, the new Canada isn't that Canada. No, that's absolutely true. And, and it's a... Um, uh, the way I describe this is that there are hard power realities, mm -hmm. military, economic, and there are soft power realities. The Harper government is not much interested in soft power realities. But we're not a hard power country, are we? You look at... Uh, we've just recently celebrated Remembrance Day, uh, and you look at uh, the contributions that have been made by Canadians to, to battles uh, internationally, including recently, the, the great valor, whatever one thinks about the, the war in, in Afghanistan, the manner of its conduct was, was superb. Yeah. Uh, we're a strong economic power. We're getting surpassed by bigger countries that were, were uh, sort of out of the play until, uh, until now. But yes, we are a hard power. We're also a soft power country. I don't think we should try to, to denigrate or diminish either one of those. The problem is this government for some time has not only not been paying attention to soft power capacities, but because it doesn't pay attention to them, it withers our reputation in the rest of the world. I think it can be built up again. I think it needs to be built up because I think it is really our distinguishing asset. How do you feel knowing that this is, I mean, not your party in power, but essentially a version of your party in power and this is the position you have? I regret that uh, that, that happened, but I fought it, as you know. Uh, like a lot of things I fought, I lost, uh, and that's that. Uh, right. There's nothing I can do about that. There's no point in nostalgia. Uh, but I think that there are a lot of people who supported the kind of, of broad approach that I took, who are members of that party, including serving members in the House of Commons, yeah. who can be brought back to that uh, broad view. You obviously had a lot of sticky stuff to deal with. We have a question from somebody connected to your past. Hi, Joe. Do you remember 33 years ago when I contacted you about offering safe haven to six U.S. diplomats in our home? What was your first thought? My first thought was that you and your colleagues, Ken Taylor, had showed immense courage and uh, that the government of Canada, which at that point was Flora MacDonald and myself, we were the two ministers, we had to respond in kind, and we did very quickly. And uh, I think together we we made an enormous difference in terms of, of indicating what, uh, uh, what governments can do in crisis. The cool heads in the first instance were the heads of the Canadian officials on the ground in Tehran. Just imagine uh, what you would have had to do. I was, I was the prime minister. I had a fairly limited uh, role I had to play at that time. Well, but you my had life, to prove the passports. I had to prove the passports. <laughs> I had to prove it all, but I wasn't on the ground uh, with the, the possibility literally every night of something happening to destroy the life I knew, uh, destroy my life. These guys did, and, uh, and uh, these guys, these men and women did uh, on the ground. Stick around more with the Right Honorable Joe Clark right after this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. He is Canada's youngest ever PM, but would he want to return to be the oldest? There's only one way to find out, next. We have stood with you in your remarkable and courageous walk to freedom, and we intend to be with you, sir, all the way along that walk until the people of South Africa are equal and free. Thank you. It's a moment. You, you and Mandela, that's a moment. It was a wonderful moment. Yeah. So, there was another moment, George, that was even more spectacular, but very private. Because I had chaired the Commonwealth Committee on for Foreign Ministers on Southern Africa, I was one of a handful of people who was invited to Lusaka, Zambia, the country next door to South Africa, when Mr. Mandela came out, just out of prison, two weeks out of prison, to visit the African National Congress in exile. That's right. And he walked into that room. There were only about 100 or so of us there, most of them ANC uh, veterans. And he spoke briefly, and there were then some questions from them. And the first one, naturally, from a grizzled veteran of the wars, was, was critical of the Afrikaans people who'd held Mr. Mandela captive. And he looked at, at his supporters and he said, we have to remember how hard this is for them, how hard this is for our captors, for the people who'd kept us down. 
I've never seen an act of generosity uh, like that, a mentality of generosity again. And, you know, it's, uh, it is the case that sometimes the actions and statements of a person reveal an inner character. That was Nelson Mandela. You were the youngest prime minister. Do you ever fancy being the oldest prime minister? I do not, no. <laughs> no thank you. I asked because you were the prime minister and then you weren't and you came back as an MP. Yeah. And I don't know leaders that do that. Well, I did that. Uh, I believed in my party. I believed in the need for a change. Uh, Mr. Mulroney defeated me. Uh, I th believed that he needed my help to, uh, to win an election. And I believed he needed my help. People to around him didn't want you there. Some. And some of the people around me didn't want him there. I mean, that's <laughs> in the nature of a competition. Uh, but uh, he wanted me there. And I look back at our partnership, which uh, was quite effective, even though we're quite different people and had different views and uh, had been, been intense competitors. But we found ways to make it work, which, and I guess one could say if Brian Mulroney and I could do that, uh, the country could do that. Right. What a real pleasure to see you, as Thank always. Thank you very this much. Book should be required reading for sure. How we lead Canada in a century of change. Thank you. Thank you, you. Thank you very much. The Right Honorable Joe Clark. We'll be right back. Thank you.